day two <coughs> of the July 98 seven day retreat in spring water. How the light changes from bright to dark. The clouds change and with that the sky, the temperature. Sometimes it's wet, other times it's dry. We call it weather in the abstract, but it's just changing, changing, changing conditions. The moment we put words to it, it's different from just being with what's there, no matter what. The sounds, the sights, the feelings, the moods, changing moods all the time, aren't they? And such a strong conditioning that this mood one finds oneself in right now is going to be here forever. At the moment it always seems this way. I don't know what kind of a lever is set in the brain to make it appear like that. And then maybe suddenly one remembers that mood is gone. Here's another one now. We call it all me, like the weather. But what is the me? What is this I? That we say is things has things, I am this, I have that, I should get this or avoid that. What is this I? That may just be an abstraction like the weather. Find out if one is interested. What is this I, this me? Track it, track it. Let thoughts help with it, whichever way. If it really stirs one to find out, because it is the I that suffers. A few people mentioned how tired they have been this first day. We say, I am so tired. Why am I so tired? What is tiredness? It's another way of inquiring, sitting there and so tired, suffering with it, as it were. I'm taking that one is sitting here, it happens sometimes overcomes one in, the, in one round. So at that moment, since we have agreed not to leave the room during one 25 minute round, can, can the question occur, what is this tiredness? It's a, it's a change from suffering it, isn't it? Oh, to find out, is it? Suffering is a different state of mind in which there are words and notions, storyline about what's happening to me. It should be different or it's justified. Telling comments about it and then reacting to the comments, to the story on and on and on, until a moment of coming to. A 
change, realizing one is tired and wondering what it is. What is it? It's a change from enduring to inquiring. And notice all the set notions we have about fatigue and tiredness and letting go of the notions and trying to be with this unknown state. One only knows it through thinking about it, reacting to it in habitual ways. And, and now a question, what is it? And no answer, just touching it, entering it, if you will. With some fresh energy of wondering. Sometimes in this fresh energy of wondering, the Tiredness fizzles, it has changed now into inquiring. So we say in the opening talk every time, unless I forget it, don't push yourself. You may have been in retreat or, or spiritual practice centers where there's a particular push against tiredness, stretch yourself, extend yourself, don't give in all of these things. Uh, I don't do this here. When tired, sleep. When hungry, eat. A very beautiful Zen word. <laughs> Particularly if one can sleep. And a lot of us uh, come in here from a lot of work and overstimulation. So we, we, we went into that. But still, not to take Maybe at a very special moment, not to take tiredness at its face value. Its face value says, I'm good for nothing but to go to sleep. That may not be true. I've learned this over the many years of doing retreats. A particularly tired time is before seven. Sometimes I lie down on the sofa in the apartment, maybe doze off for a while and when I come to, I'm so tired, I don't want to get up. Everything in the body says, stay down. But I can't stay down. Meetings start at 7. So I get up, into the meeting room, the first question comes up, and there's no tiredness. The, the energy has changed. Even though one was totally worn out before. And, and we all know this phenomenon. Tired, and a friend calls up, a real good friend, says, hello, I'm coming over. Where's the tiredness? One sits and talks till all hours. So not to take any of these states that seem to so burden us or bother us or weigh on us, not to take them too seriously. They're temporary states made up of many different ingredients which can change at any one time. Which is not saying push to push oneself. I'm not saying that. Just not to take one's states at face value. And if there's time and interest and energy to inquire into them and find out more about this stuff, which seems so dense, so tight, and is actually so airy and light. Empty space. Which is what we are, what all of the universe and galaxies are. Empty space. Tiny bit of matter, mostly energy. Mostly potential energy is what 
physicists tell us. And never mind what they think about or figure out in their abstract formulae, it's palpable for each one of us to come upon. Empty space and energy. Coming together in creating something, doing something, working on something. Relating with each other. That's the biggest nut to crack for human beings. Relating with each other. Times it seems totally uncrackable. <laughs> How to be with each other because we're all hard nuts. <laughs> nuts of me and mine. Not that we think as much in those terms, although, although if we did, we would see more easy what bothers us, what troubles us. Is me, my me versus your me. Which one will win? which one will have to give in. That's a, it's another beautiful exercise. We, we started out with questioning into tiredness. Another one is to watch like a good objective scientist, watch what it is that our thoughts and activities and reactivities <laughs> revolve around all day long and usually continued in our dreams at night. And maybe to one's surprise, maybe not, one may find it revolves 99% around me. I'm not saying that derogatively, condemningly, but just factually, to, to, to get in touch with that. Because the images we have of ourselves of being selfless, altruistic, or at least a little bit so, we would like to be more so, the images don't help in observing. They, they shield, they protect, and distort. I remember talking a little bit in this vein with a person years ago. And, and she came back a, a week later and she said, it is embarrassing. There is nothing I think or do which does not have me at its central core. Now, to find it embarrassing means what? Shameful, some people say, I'm ashamed. At these selfish thoughts and selfish actions, often wrapped into some veil of unselfishness. And yet, if the veil is looked through a bit, there's selfishness hiding inside. And why can't we see this clearer? Why? Why is it so hard, so, so painful? Because it's so painful for some people that for a while they don't come to retreat because they don't want to hear about it, be faced with it. It's too hurtful. There is too much conditioning in this body-mind about having to be good and how bad it is not to be good. It's conditioned into all of us, to one extent or another, that the standards of goodness vary depending on what group or association one finds oneself in. But such strong imagery, such strong attachment and fear of not fulfilling the image, which gets in the way of pure, simple, honest observation and discovery. Mm -hmm. 
as long as there is attachment to being unselfish, altruistic, all of these uh, ideals swirl around in the head. As long as there is attachment to them, there is no direct awareness of what we are, what we do, what motivates us, what beckons us, what scares us. And then we say we're confused. Confusion always means I can't, it can't be this way, it must be someplace else or something else, somewhere else. Some way other. That's confusion. If there's clarity about what reveals itself, there's no confusion. It is so. If there's the thought it shouldn't be so, then I say I am confused. Someone brought this problem up this morning or last night, I don't remember. Being vegetarian, not eating meat, not wanting to hurt, living beings, sentient beings, and then I don't quite recall, maybe friends saying, well, you're still eating living things, you're eating plants, you're eating fruit, you're eating grain, you're eating all kinds of stuff which is living. It was troublesome to this person to think that there's nothing I can eat that is not a living thing. And thought says you are disturbing life for your own sake. See, thought, when thought comes in with its moralizing, it becomes really confusing. We live in these contradictory thought processes and feel there's no way out. What, what does life feed on? The plants, the animals, the little bacteria, algae, fish, lions, human beings. What, what does life have to offer to itself for food but life? There's no other resource. That's a fact, isn't it? Please clear it up if I see this wrong. And how clear is the mind and body this moment in seeing, in responding. Not responding to ideas of what is right and wrong, but seeing. I remember in, in years past, particularly our childhood, stepping on all kinds of bugs. We, we did this as kids, it was fun the crunching. We also said to each other, that was in Germany, I don't know whether they have something equivalent in this country. We said to each other, my mother says little brown animals should be stepped on. <laughs> and Alvin said, my mother says little black animals should be stepped on and crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> And this amazing discovery, not through ideas, not through morals or vegetarianism, of, of seeing an ant crawl along or a mosquito and not automatically crunching it or crushing it. By which I'm not saying I never kill ants or mosquitoes. I have a trap in the apartment, a little ant motel, I think they call it. 
because ants are a nuisance, more than a nuisance, in a house. But can we see an ant? Can we see a mosquito? Not we should, but it happens. And there's, there's a completely different mentality than this uh, rote game my mother says, step, step on it. And the same, same with each other in our relationship. Usually what we see in each other, find out for yourself, is pictures of what I picture you to be. Already, if I haven't seen you before, there are all kinds of pictures of people who look like you and they sort of project themselves on a real human being. Let alone if we've hurt each other, fought each other, or loved each other. No, we can get things for each, from each other. All of this is recorded in memory and skillfully albeit unconsciously, projected on each other. And that's what we respond and react to most of the time. The picture of what you did, what you are like, with regard to me, my memory, my, whatever, integrity. One feels one's integrity has been hurt. Or put, one's, a true integrity cannot be hurt, cannot be offended. Only the idea of me can, can be hurt and offended. So, just like with the little ants and mosquitoes, there comes a moment, it's like a miracle, in which we see each other, I won't say for anybody else, see, one sees someone without pictures. The pictures are not irrelevant. They are in abeyance, there is a presence, in which a person appears as they are this moment. And just like with a little ant or mosquito, there is a different relationship to someone <coughs> who is not pictured in the mind, but seen. It's a beautiful moment, a moment which evokes lovingness, Friendliness. Zuneigung, you say in German. Bending toward somebody. So. The, the whole me process is fraught with pictures, with memories. It's stuffed with it. Pictures remembered from the past and projected into the future and into the present. Pictures, sometimes we say pictures, other times we say ideas, thoughts, storyline. And for some reason, human beings have found a comfortable dwelling place in stories about each other and about myself. And we're questioning this whole story line dwelling of ours, whether it can come to light and be seen for the farce it is. It's not real. What is, what is real is this moment, I don't even know yet what the story is, that comes later. So to, to discover storyline evolving out of an incident right now, the incident is real, you said something. Do I feel hurt? Maybe I do. And the story starts spinning. Can it be seen instantly or, or whenever and not fall prey to it? Because it 
colors and distorts the whole scenario. What really happened? Just like we, when we wake up in, in sitting to say, what is really going on right now? And to become wise about the difference of story dwelling and being here, even though often story dwelling has much more uh, stimulation to it. Particularly since we live so much in story and get so stimulated from it, a moment of no story seems sort of dull. Flat, but that's, that's only temporary. Not to take that flatness or boredom at face value. But to stay here for a while, as one cannot help doing in a retreat. Everyone, no matter how hard the times, how much the story, how much the thoughts and garbage that swirls around, one cannot help but be with it in one way or another. There's not much else to do. So that toward the end of retreat or after retreat, people report, or oh, during retreat already, how green the trees, how alive the sky or the bird song. Being with the, the dullness of the moment and, and sitting, if this is what is happening, is still withness and a growing sensitivity, opening, not fighting, not resisting, just being with the whole nine yards of whatever's going on. With which we come to the, to the main question I was going to bring up in this talk, the time is almost over. What is my practice here? People ask this come here for the first time, not that people who come here for the first time haven't done sittings and meditation, some of them for 10, 20 years, they tell me. So there are very few real newcomers. But still, one comes to a place, one wants to adjust and, and con conform. So what is your practice here? What should I do? What do people do here? Or give me, some, give me some practice. I need something. If I don't have a practice, I fall apart or there's chaos. So that's one's practice, the chaos. To be with what's there. Not to use a device, a mental, physical device to get away from intimacy with what is happening in a human being who comes to a quiet place. Always for the first time. For me, it's always the first time. So, and a lot of people tell me that. It's much harder not to have a practice just to, to be here. <coughs> much more difficult. Likewise, it's probably much more difficult to give talks about no practice than do this and do that and you'll get enlightened. <laughs> it really is very arduous. <laughs> and still, one, one can't help doing what one needs to do, which is talk together about sitting down and being with the first thing that comes up. Or noticing in retrospect as one wakes up, what has been is now in a memory hopper twirling around. I was thinking, I was fantasizing. And yet there is a moment of waking up. It happens for every human being all the time. We come to, to presence, to being here for a moment. And then, of course, unless there's some stability in the awareness, thought takes over and evaluates what I did, what I should be doing, what is good, what is bad. 
It's so, so difficult to not let thought take over telling what this was, what this is, what there should be. And just listen to breathing and birds and physical sensations all over the body. One thought, one thought arouses, potentially arouses this entire body. An angry thought, a hateful thought, a desirous thought, a pleasant memory, thought of what I should be doing, what I forgot to do. One thought and the body changes under the impact of this one thought. And no one did it, it happened. Where is the I in this? Where is me? Is there a me doing, thinking the thought, well, there should now be some heart pounding? There should now be some blood rushing to the, to the head? Of course, it's absurd. There's no me in this. There's only an amazing interrelation of thinking and feeling and sensing and emoting and responding and more thoughts and more physical orchestration. Watch it. Watch it. Watch the spectacle without meddling in it. No need to interfere with it, to do something about it, or to resist it. Seeing is all. Awaring is everything. And the more stable this awareness turns out to be, the more can be seen, the more subtle thought processes and physical reactions and delusions. Our whole system operating for everyone to some degree or another, our whole system of paranoia, they have it in for me. They are against me. To watch it, how it unfolds, and how the body responds, and no one is doing it. It is all thought, activity, memory, and projection activity based on ideas, convictions, accumulated in the past. Not just oneself, one's family, one's country, and nation, tribe. We have shared paranoias about those others who are after us, competing with us. Let's find out what's really so. And we cannot find this out unless the vision is clear of this whole me circuit. As long as that me circuit operates, the vision is clouded. Are we saying too much at one time, am I? Ah, to listen to that. So simple. I just wanted to, to say this one thing, and it can unfold and expand throughout the retreat. If something isn't clear, or you want to go further into it, or want to repeat it, or want to say something different than that, please bring it up in meetings. That's what meetings can be used for. You don't have to accept anything. This one thing to put out in connection with the question, what, what, is, what is it you're doing here? I like to join in, I like to partake of it, and participate in it. It is fundamentally a twofold thing, or has two aspects, this work of this moment not take the words too seriously. I have no others right now. Two aspects to it. One of them is 
to, to begin to aware our conditioning. Let it come into consciousness, into awareness. Consciousness is still judgmental. I'm calling consciousness connected with thought <laughs> and memory and so forth. Awareness has no judgment. So to, to come upon this conditioned body-mind operating in every human being on this earth, to come upon it, to explore it, bring it to light, question it, wonder about it, share about it. And the other aspect being this amazing quiet and emptiness in which everything takes place, to come upon that. One knows not how. It's, it's, it's there. It's not something we have set out to find in the future in India, or Mecca, or Jerusalem. It's here. It's here. This amazing quiet in which the rain falls everywhere. And out of this amazing quiet, which we also call awareness, presence, non-separation. Out of that, conditioning reveals itself for what it is. together in the rain, in the breathing, in the listening, thundering. We will end here for today.
going on. Um, and kind of going back into it, you know, kind of coming back in the door, back out the door you came in. I'm not, I'm not sure how to put it. Um, and it seems like that's really the only answer, um, the only real security is kind of seeing the whole thing, including the asking the questions, the asker or whatever. I think one of the dangers of finding the answers in our society or the world today is that maybe you find the wrong answer. Maybe you get so wedded to your answer that you become like this fellow at the bottom of the, uh, um, the federal building of the old city. He was searching and he found an answer and he really believed his answer. Uh, we can't understand it, but. Um, I think there's a danger in being so committed to an idea or to an answer today that you can do a lot of harm. Sounds like the history of the world, though. Yeah. It is, but it, it clearly shows the danger of assuming there's a right answer to a question. That's, we're supposed to have the right answer. That's our training. Probably one of the, you were talking about fear, one of the greatest fears is being wrong. When I see myself, at least, having designed the wrong system that doesn't work. Blame. <laughs> then the image comes up of the Fool that, that, that did this. Normally, <clears throat> fools want to be brilliant. So, so what you're describing, going with the question, the question, the question, it's quite radically different than and the way this brain has been trained. You know, like I've been sitting here all weekend looking at this floor. Wondering how the hell you'd ever sand the floor with knots in it and not get ripples. Now, I'm never going to sand the floor in my life, and if I didn't answer, I wouldn't want to do it anyway.
No, it seems to me we've, we've talked about the need for answers, the value of questions, the value of understanding. It seems like that in all those cases, yes, there are situations under which we need answers, we need to react, we have to ask questions, we need understanding. But then there's a whole set of situations where those kind of things are totally inappropriate. They don't do the job. And it seems to me life is somehow constructing a balance for yourself on all of those things. I feel that like Wayne does when I do something wrong. There's a tremendous pressure I feel to do something do it right. Um, I think why I feel I so badly when I do something wrong is I feel that I'm worthless as a human being. And I think that's part of our the conditioning in the society is we make we don't say this is the wrong way to do it. You're a good person even though you didn't do this right. Here's the right way to do it. It's condemning the whole person. A whole human being. Uh, I think of it in, in the newspapers when someone makes uh, a joke and they use the uh, non politically correct word. His whole career was ruined. His whole, his whole life, and automatically, the person's brain is, is an evil person. And that makes one a lot more fearful in life if you're if you if you're a really low human being rather than just doing something that was a mistake. Isn't the threat precisely because we assume there's a right and a wrong way? Because that's how we act. We act like there's a wrong way, we act like there's a right way. And we, there's no escape from that. The only escape is to assume that there's not a right way and a wrong way, there are just many ways. <clears throat> one can do more, one can do less, one can do differently. <clears throat> I wonder if one solution is if, uh, if I feel this way about being so right, if I try to develop more tolerance towards other people that maybe I feel better uh, myself that they're, I don't, know, I don't know what I'm saying really, but just that, that because I feel there's a right and wrong right, way so much that it affects me when I feel I've done something that isn't right. But isn't it sometimes that what we fear is um um, so what comes out of it, you know, like, I think I do something wrong, but I feel what is, uh, what, what will happen to me because of that. And so that's, for me, anyway, mostly the awful feeling. And sometimes I'm quite surprised <laughs> when these things don't happen, or um, it, it turns out I'm late, and it turns out this was the best thing that could ever happen to <laughs> so, me. Something strange that it's quite um, funny to me anyway. To, um, um, yeah, but I think the consequences of something, something well, they are not always what they're supposed to. We develop these false stories in our heads about what will happen if we get it wrong. Okay? And then, it doesn't matter. <laughs> this does it was all a big. It was all story in the head. Yeah. It seems like for granted what what comes out at that moment. But. I take yoga classes at the 92nd Street Y in New York, and when you check in, you have to turn in your ID card. And I carry around this terrible fear of forgetting my ID card, and it's happened a couple of times. I've just about been late because I had to go home and get my ID card. And finally, the other day, I went out. And I realized I didn't have it. <clears throat> Going back up 35 stories to get it. 
and I said, I'll be late. I'm just going, just go and be there and see what happens. So I walked in and I said to the lady at the desk, I forgot my ID card, and she said, <laughs> I had agonized over it. I'm just wondering now if there's something that doesn't need to be secure. Five minutes ago, was thoughts about rain washing down the driveway, taking on the gravel down <laughs> with it. Now it's just
Let's have some prayer today.